I'm Bayabar Sursik. I'm the director of the International Fact Checking Network. And I'm really happy to be able to organize this session on the occasion of the International Fact Checking Day, actually the fifth International Fact Checking Day. Uh, for those who are a part of the international fact checking community, um, you, you might be um, remembering the Global Fact Conference back in Buenos Aires in 2016, uh, where fact checkers decided to dedicate April 2nd uh, as the International Fact Checking Day. Um, it makes sense to name the day on the April 2nd, since uh, April Fool's Day is has been um, in different ways being celebrated in all different parts of the world. So fact checkers just wanted to remind the, uh, the public to the importance of reliable and accurate information uh, the day after the April Fool's Day. So we have a great panel today uh, for us to discuss the state of the fact checking in 2021. And I'm more than honored to have uh, my dear colleagues and friends uh, to uh, discuss this with me today uh, for those who haven't you be, who haven't been able to uh, see what we have done so far for the International Fact Checking Day, please check out uh, our website factcheckingday.com to get new tips and information on how to detect misinformation um, and uh, check it out what the fact checking organizations around the world have been doing to combat misinformation uh, in a global scale. So we have today Ojin from factcheck.org, uh, Kate from Africa Check, and Gilin from Tate. Um, and I would like to just uh, give the floor them to them for quick introductions, and then we will kick off the conversation. Uh, I'm going to start with Kate. Hi, Kate. Can you introduce yourself a little bit? Thanks, Bevaz. Hi, everyone. My name is Kate Wilkinson. Um, I'm currently in Johannesburg, South Africa, and I am the deputy chief editor at Africa Check, which is the continent's leading fact-checking organization. We are a fact-checking organization that was set up in 2012 first in Johannesburg, South Africa, but since then we have opened offices in three other African countries to ensure that we cover the continent and all of its claims adequately. So we have teams in Kenya, Nairobi, and then a French language website which works out of Senegal. I mainly focus on editorial output from South Africa with my team of fact checkers here, but I also manage a number of projects for the organization. One of them is our project in partnership with Phil Fact and Checkiado, two other notable fact checking organizations who we've been working with to develop artificial intelligence tools to make fact checking faster and more efficient. And then I'm also the host of What's Crap on WhatsApp, which was very kindly supported by the IFCN a couple of years ago to get off the ground. Thanks, Bebas. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, and Eugene, uh, thanks a lot for joining. Uh, you and I are the only two person who are in the same time zone in this panel. Um, so happy to have you in this early time of today. And also Kate and Gulin for making the time. Uh, would you just introduce yourself to our audience? Sure. Uh, yeah, my name is Eugene Kiley. I'm the director at factcheck.org. Uh, factcheck.org has been around since 2003. It's the oldest um, political fact checking site that's uh, in the United States, I think uh, the world as well. Uh, it was started by um, Brooks Jackson, who was a, uh, an investigative reporter at the Wall Street Journal, the Associated Press, uh, CNN, um, and Kathleen Hall Jameson. Who is who was the dean of the Annenberg School for Public of Annenberg School for Communications at the University of Pennsylvania, um, and is now the uh, director of the Annenberg Public Policy Center. Uh, we're based at the University of Pennsylvania, um, and uh, what, we have nine people currently working full time for us, and we also have a fellowship program with four students uh, from the University of Pennsylvania who help us. Uh, we uh, focus on social media uh, misinformation, political misinformation, and um, misinformation that's specifically targeted um, at uh, distorting uh, science and scientific research. Uh, we have a project called uh, SciCheck that we started in 2015. Um, and myself, I've been in journalism since uh, 1980s, early 1980s. So I've been doing this a long time. I was with the USA Today. I was at Philadelphia Inquirer. Um, and I've been here for 11 years. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Eugene. And Gulin, uh, my friend and colleague from my home country, Turkey, it's good to have you here. How are you? I'm from Turkey and I'm editor-in-chief of Tate. 
and Tate launched in 2016. And during that time, um, I big crisis times uh, for Turkey uh, because it's uh, the bomb explosions and many shootings ha uh, happened during that time. And Tait was born in such a crisis time. And we are mostly trying to, we were trying to tackle with the uh, disinformation in the traumatic times on social media. But after that, we saw that uh, there were many different crisis times like uh, today, like pandemic, but we also trying to tackle with uh, elections and many viral contents on social media and news organizations. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you so much, uh, Faris Gulin. So uh, I'm going to start the conversation by asking a couple of questions to our panelists, and then we'll be asking them to present their own perspective to those questions, because the three of our panelists today uh, come from different backgrounds and come from different geographies, and they cope with similar but different challenges in different parts of the world. So Kate, uh, my question is going to be about um, your experience in the, especially in the last 12 months, to cope with the increasing uh, threat posed by the misinformation and disinformation, especially in a continent in, like Africa, where uh, there are so many different uh, health-related uh, fact-checking projects in the past have contributed to this fact-checking field. And Africa Check has been working on multiple different countries how that had been, you know, um, easy or challenging for you with that existing capacity in health-related misinformation, um, particularly, you know, during the Ebola outbreak, uh, how Africa Check had been able to um, use that capacity to tackle this ever-increasing and, you know, record high level of uh, misinformation. Thanks, Babas. Yeah, I think that um, when fact check had started at the beginning of the infodemic, we kept telling ourselves depending on the length of your lockdown, that it was just going to be three weeks or three months. And then we told ourselves it would be a year and now we're at a year. And I think we've all had to readjust our perspectives and how we view time and accept that this is probably going to be the state of affairs for the foreseeable future. We have been lucky in the sense that over the last few years, we've really spent the time ensuring that we are connected with different communities in the countries where we work. But luckily also just prior to um, the outbreak of the pandemic, we had developed a few new channels where we were able to both reach people, uh, disseminate information, but importantly solicit submissions and really stay in touch with people so we knew what was happening on the ground. So there are really two ways that we've been able to, first of all, you know, get a grasp on the size of the epidemic and the countries where we work, but also then try to make good choices about what we're gonna fact check. So um, the two projects that I mentioned in the intro have really been um, central to a lot of that work of, you know, monitoring. And the first is our um, grant that we've been working on with Google.org, and that has been a three-year grant where three fact-checking organizations have been provided the funding, uh, the expertise, and the support from Google.org to build tools based on artificial intelligence, where we're able to monitor media on a running 24 hour basis and that tool essentially what it does is that it is extracting scanning and then presenting to us on a daily basis a list of claims which are fact checkable and this has been a game changer to us because essentially what it has done is it's taken that responsibility really out of the hands of fact checkers we don't need to have fact checkers reading the news you know setting up google alerts trying to find important claims to fact check they can do what they're good at which is fact checking speaking to experts looking at research and pulling it all together um, so that tool has really been pivotal and then the second one that has helped us um, grasp the problem which is less automated and that's the beauty of it is our what's crap on whatsapp project and that is essentially where we have decided to meet people where they are when it comes to false information and increasingly that is on whatsapp so we have dedicated whatsapp channels in the countries where we work where we not only disseminate information but we have people sending it to us on a, a daily basis and it's not automated and that is the beauty of it but it's also sometimes the curse 
because during the height of the pandemic, we had one person, you know, with the phone working from home because we couldn't be in the office and they would be waking up every morning with 800 messages. And it was a very manual process of them going through each one, responding, logging the claim, sending it to our researchers um, so that we could start sifting through it and, and seeing what was most important. Wow, thank you so much. I mean, two things that I just like, you know, couldn't help myself to take notes. Like you mentioned the importance of like detecting misinformation and um, how AI has been helping you to at least, you know, um, basically ease down that workload for uh, the people in the staff. Uh, and also like how misinformation travels, particularly on WhatsApp uh, or any other given messenger gap would be also the case in different regions. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, if I may use this as a segue to address the question to you, Eugene, uh, you have been also working with um, Spanish broadcasters in the US to inform uh, the Spanish speaker audiences with accurate information, particularly during the election and now still around the, you know, the infodemic. So uh, with that in mind, do you think this new area last 12 months have created a new um, type of challenge for a fact check that for fact check.org, the oldest fact checking organization um, in the nation? Um, or what has been different in the sense that, you know, uh, came with the infodemic uh, for you uh, in this process? Right. Um, yeah, we're uh, like an old dog uh, being taught new tricks here. Um, with the, we knew it was going to be a challenging year because of the 2020 presidential election, right? Um, so uh, we were trying to work with Univision. Um, I was meeting with someone at Univision months and months and months uh, earlier before the election, before in, in uh, 20, late 2018, early 20, uh, 2019. It wasn't until working with uh, the IFCN and uh, WhatsApp that we were able to get the funding to finally uh, do what we wanted to do, which was to translate our stories uh, about the election into uh, Spanish. Um, and, and that was terrific and really appreciate uh, IFC and stepping up and, and making that happen. Um, but what it also kind of exposed to, uh, to us is, you know, we need to reach out to uh, a, a new and more diverse audience. Um, we were particularly seeing that with uh, COVID-19. As COVID-19 was developing, you know, you were seeing that Hispanics Blacks, Native Americans were being disproportionately affected by COVID-19, um, and also that uh, these communities had this vaccine hesitancy that was going to prevent them from getting what they need in order to, uh, you know, in order to 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 live. Um, so one of the things that that uh, we started to, to focus on was uh, expanding to include. COVID-19 misinformation in, in Spanish. Uh, we were working with uh, Univision again to try to get uh, some funding for a project, which we did uh, through the uh, Google News Initiative. Uh, and we had uh, just started that. So we were able to, with that funding and also funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that we got in January, able to hire a, a, a bilingual reporter we we're able to uh, contract with uh, a translator. So now we are, we have uh, probably two dozen stories on our site now in Spanish uh, on COVID-19. And that is our focus now uh, in 2021 is on COVID-19, getting accurate information to uh, underserved communities, as well as our own um, you know, audience that we've had, a loyal uh, old white audience really. <laughs> So uh, yeah, it's been, uh, this has been a great experience and kind of re rejuvenated all of us in uh, now tackling um, a, a new, kind of a, a, a new way of doing fact checking for us. Yeah. Well, I mean, especially at a year where you also had the elections, uh, probably the most challenging elections for a fact checker combining with a pandemic um, definitely shouldn't be like, you know, every year job for fact checkers. Um, it's, exhausting. Uh, it's exhausting, absolutely. Um, 
So I guess Gunnar and I can talk about like the challenges, particular to Turkey for like, you know, days and, you know, weeks. But I mean, uh, for the sake of our uh, audience's sanity, I think uh, they will be really interested in hearing about like, uh, as a faction organization in Turkey, um, what has been one thing that you have seen that was unique with the pandemic um, and also similar to other panelists, how you uh, have been able to navigate this um, record high, you know, workload um, as a factory organization in Turkey? Um, thank you, Bye Boris. Actually, the, the new thing for also Tate is the, the key during the pandemic is uh, actually we are more uh, trying to do community oriented strategy and we are trying to uh, do more collaboration with different uh, groups in Turkey. Uh, this, this really helped us to tackle with infodemic and this pandemic because uh, with this perspective, we engage with our audiences uh, more and turn them to the community, especially with our COVID-19 newsletter, we try to reach a different group of people with different formats. And we not just fact check this information, we also uh, trying to sustain accurate information with this newsletter. And we trying to filter and clar clarify that this complicated situations and this complicated information um, overload to, to, for the people. And also actually it's really helped us to openly share uh, the struggles we are trying to tackle and or happiness we, during this really um, upsetting times. And it's really uh, actually increased the relationship with our community and it's really important for us. Uh, secondly, we realized that um, the, the Azerbaijan also have uh, similar problems like Turkey and we have actually a uh, similar political context, uh, similar and uh, language. So we uh, expand our works to the Azerbaijan during the pandemic uh, because it's, um, it's really important to uh, understand the, the, the countries uh, besides us. And, and the, the other thing is actually um, the collaboration is it's really key things for us because we have a chance to collaborate with different actors in Turkey. And the countries like in Turkey, it, it's a little bit to collaborate with different organizations because I think it's a little bit cultural things. It's a little bit hard to uh, working together, but uh, we actually success during the pandemic because actually pandemic shows us the collaboration and working together is, a, is really important in such a, a crisis times. So we collaborate with uh, health experts, teachers network, uh, tech companies, use AIs, research, researchers, associations, journalists, TV channel municipalities. And it's really important time for TAE to collaborate and um, discussing all things and putting this strategy in our actually future works. So um, also our incubation um, incubation factory helps us to, uh, coming uh, together with people who have different skill sets and it's really helped us to um, make more powerful contents and spreading this contents to different echo chambers and different communities. So it's uh, it's a it's an important thing, and also this period helps us to. We are really good at to tackling with the short term crisis like earthquakes, like I don't know bombings, uh, something like this. And also we had um, experience mid level crisis like elections or something like this. But now we should have. Uh, approach such a long-term crisis and it's really important uh, things to learn uh, tackling with such a long uh, crisis and it's um, kind of an advantage to learn this um, with the team and it's really make us more powerful when we are tackling with misinformation. 
thank you so much for this good um it, it, it's probably very easy for many uh, participants in this you know uh session to resonate with uh the challenges that you kate and ojin have been able to share with the audience in different perspectives and i see that we have a very diverse set of participants in the uh among our audience today uh, we have some shout outs from um, india russia poland uh, jordan uh, the US, Singapore, Hamburg, uh, the Philippines, Albania. So it's really good to see the global factoring community have allocated this day, not only necessarily to just like um, celebrate our work, but also learn from one another. So that's a great you know, opportunity. I will be just like asking one question from the audience to Kate, and then uh, we'll try to um, shift gears to another topic, which I'm really uh, interested in hearing your thoughts about. Um, Kate, uh, Alan from Verifiles asks, how uh, did you tackle and navigate the privacy issues when you were uh, bringing, you know, uh, content from WhatsApp and, you know, sharing your fact checks? Uh, have you been able to um, address that or is it something that um, you are still figuring out? Uh, we'll be more than happy to hear your um, thoughts on this. Yeah, um, I was having a look at that question earlier. So I think the, the first part of this question was, you know, are we taking um, the fact checks that we, we take from WhatsApp to other social media platforms? And the answer is absolutely yes. So we're often asked, as all fact checkers are, you know, how do you choose what to fact check? And when it comes to WhatsApp, um, we have our own approach. Um, the first thing is for our project, What's Crap on WhatsApp, the the sort of the, the the hint is in the name. A lot of the the submissions that we get, a lot of the content that we get sent for fact checking, is hoaxy crap. It is stuff that is littering people's WhatsApps. Um, it's stuff that people probably know isn't true, but you maybe forward it because you think it might be a bit funny and you don't want to risk not forwarding it if it is true. So we get submissions every month. And then twice a month, we produce a five to seven minute long voice note, which we disseminate via um, via WhatsApp. And when it comes to choosing the content to fact check for the show, we really have two criteria. Uh, the first is we want to fact check the content that is the most pressing or the most dangerous. So if we've seen a viral um, supposed cure for COVID that we've also seen circulating maybe on other platforms or even just on WhatsApp, if it's dangerous and it could mislead people and result in harm, um, or even death, that's what we're going to fact check. But then we also want to fact check the most popular submission. So even if there's something really hoaxy and crappy that people have submitted, there's a demand, we, we give the people what they want. And then we do publish that elsewhere. So we make sure that everything we fact check on the show is also fact checked on our website so that it can be interrogated um, and checked out by the people. Uh, fact um, go yeah. ahead, sorry, go ahead, please. Fact-checking on WhatsApp is a tricky enterprise, and I think there are a lot of fact-checking organizations and WhatsApp itself are trying to figure out the best way to do it. Um, like I said, we do a, a manual way. We don't have any automations. We don't have a chatbot. Um, we have a person or people with phones interacting with people and logging submissions. So when people send us content, it is sent directly from them to us, and we are a receiver of that content. Um, so we are party to it. Um, we fact check it and then we, when we disseminate that content, we are sending it back via broadcast function. So that is going again from us as one user directly to another user. Um, the, the, the issue and the, some of the challenges with a project of this nature is that there are zero analytics. You know, we're all used to knowing how many viewers we have on our website, how many people don't downloaded our podcast. But when it comes to trying to do fact checking on WhatsApp, you don't have any of that. So you really have to be quite creative about trying to figure out your impact on the platform. Great. And there are also follow up questions, which I think I, we should be able to also follow up after the panel as well. But I really appreciate these questions coming. So um, you, you touched on a very important point there, Kate, which is, you know, people submit to you stuff that you they, they want you to fact check. Um, and that also applies on several different, you know, uh, platforms as well. Fact checkers are sent uh, content, uh, po potentially misleading content, uh, to be fact checked, and that is then up to the users, the uh, the readers, the needs consumers, or even the tech platforms to use those fact checks in any way they want. 
Uh, but unfortunately, in the last couple of um, months and probably years, I would be able to say, uh, fact checkers are constantly being um, attacked or labeled as censors, uh, agents of censorship. Um, and I, I think um, th this would make a lot of sense to ask this question to you, Eugene, because, you know, with the elections in the US, uh, we had a very uh, contentious nature of conversation around fact checking. Um, I, I think you would be able to, you know, resonate well with the increasing, uh, the ever increasing perception of fact checking, the recognition of fact checking. Uh, once a, you know, niche practice within journalism, now fact checking has become a household name for pretty much uh, everyone um, in the U.S. and all around the world. So, um, how do you think fact checkers have been able to um, cope with these uh, allegations of censorship, particularly fueled by uh, people in power and influence, and not necessarily happy with the, you know, with fact checkers, you know, uh, fact checking them? Uh, would you be able to relate to that? Oh yes, <laughs> our inbox is filled with people uh, who are Facebook users who have gotten, you know, one of their posts uh, labeled as uh, partly false or whatever. Um, and, you know, uh, the level of vitriol in these emails is, is astonishing. And it's just, it's just gotten worse and worse over, you know, since the election uh, that has just fueled it. And, uh, you know, the, the actions that have been taken by Twitter and Facebook in particular uh, against some of the political content, which Facebook said it, initially they weren't going to, uh, to touch, that they were just going to let that uh, uh, go uncensored, if you will. Um, but um, what, from a fact-checking perspective, the, it's just nonsense to call what we are doing uh, censorship. It's, it, it's actually the complete opposite of censorship. We're providing more information. We're providing context. It's, it's just ludicrous and, and you know, it's, it, it just irked by anyone who, uh, bring, who brings that up. So I, I, I always respond to emails when uh, when when I get those uh, kinds of claims, um, you know, and I, I I think it's the, the it's the social as I explained them it's the social media platforms that decide what goes on their platforms. Um, really, what what we do very little of what we do actually results in posts being taken down, you know, uh, because posts being taken down usually because of you know some racial context or um, you know, hate or, or danger uh, to individuals. And, you know, it's not generally what, what we're writing about. Although with COVID, you know, we have seen that. Um, so, you know, there's, uh, there has been an aspect of, you know, uh, of that. But, um, you know, it's, it's really up to the social uh, media platform to decide what they're going to remove. What we're writing about, you know, maybe the, the posts wind up uh, getting um, less distribution, but it's not taken down. It's it's up there. It's it's we're providing context. Uh, sometimes on Facebook, you know, the the uh, image is all uh, grayed out, which is um, you know something that um, is a, a step beyond um, really what. Um, probably most people on Facebook users want to see they they the uh, when they have the missing context label and they can click on that and get more information um, that doesn't seem to uh, annoy Facebook users as much as when their content is just completely uh, grayed out um, but again we're providing context we're providing information it's not censorship you, I mean, uh, I couldn't uh, think of any better way to put that out. Fact checking is not censorship. And I guess the way that we communicate our fact checks um, or the way that uh, the fact checkers uh, work have been perceived by people who are not happy with those fact checks uh, should be addressed rather than, you know, uh, pointing out fact checkers as censors. Um, and Gulin, um, this question also might uh, make some like resonation with uh, the challenge that you have briefly touched on. Um, and lately also Tate has been under some um, coordinated attack, I would say, uh, not necessarily from pro-government um, outlets, uh, interestingly, but also uh, some outlets that were uh, kind of seen as like more mainstream and independent. Um, do you think that has something to do with the increasing recognition of fact-checking uh, around the world and how you have been able to cope with that lately? 
Um, actually, we, I can mention about uh, two type of censorship allegations, especially during the pandemic. But um, actually, the, the problem is Tate fact-checked many mainstream media companies and also alternative opposite uh, media groups. And so because of this, we put targets uh, in both sides and they all actually uh, making allegations about uh, Tate censored our contents, our news because of the, the Facebook uh, labelings and they lost their reach and impact uh, in the platform. Uh, the, the problem is actually, of course, it's not a censorship, but it's um, create an effect on their uh, agenda and on their social media uh, reach. So they get angry and they actually um suspicious about uh, the relationship with the fact checkers and the and the, this um fact checking organizations and um i think that the problem of this discussion is the media organizations uh don't want to see fact checkers as a journalist and they argue that um the the, the people or, or the organizations uh, who are not, I don't know, um, journalists cannot uh, say something about our contents. And actually, this is really limited discussions because they think that the, the journalists uh, just judge the journalists and not the others can say something about their uh, contents and uh, the accuracy of their contents. So the problem is, Actually, in our context, um, the the credibility of fact checkers trying to be uh, decreased, and it's a real um, issue uh, from the both side. And we are tackling to uh, with this problem and trying to solve uh, the how legitimate our works and how we are stick with our methodology. And we are trying to um, trying to share our methodology and trying to um, explain what is the behind of this misinformation and how we can solve this problem together. Because this information and misinformation problem is not just the, the problem of the fact checkers. It's really important for the media organizations because the audience really don't want to see false information from their sides and it's really, um, actually decrease their reputations also. So we are sometimes trying to reach these media organizations and, uh, and we said that we can organize trainings and we can share our methodology and we can share our methods to tackle with this problem. So one uh, method is trying to achieve is um, this. And another thing is, I think um, journalists, see these actions as a censorship and put fact-checking platforms into the target. However, platforms need to develop more concrete relationship and collaboration with media organizations also. The problem is media organizations don't have any idea about what Facebook are trying to do or what other um, media or um, tech platforms trying to do. So we should maybe uh, force and we should just uh, demand more relationship with the media organizations and the tech platforms. The second type of um, allegations actually came from the uh, health topics because in this uh, health issues, there are several benefit groups. So when we fact check something about, for example, some pills or some fake cures or health subsidies or something like this, they see uh, this as an attack to their product or company. So they, they see as an evil or say they just say that you are working with this uh, pharmacy groups and you try to uh, decrease our reputation or something like this. So it's um, two different type of allegations uh, as a censorship. But I think the key thing is we have to uh, share our methodology and we have to um, just try to explain why we are doing this and not having uh, bad 
any intentions to doing this. So we are trying to do this, but I don't know how we can uh, achieve this now, but yes, we are working on this. This is great. I, I mean, the next panel after this one will be about communicating our fact checks with different audiences. And I totally hear your point about like, you know, the platform should be more in touch with the publishers to make sure that they know what type of like, you know, enforcements that they might be uh, facing, uh, provided that they fail, um, you know, um, publishing uh, accurate information. Um, so, Kate, um, again, in an organization, in an organization that operates in different countries and languages, um, do you see any similarities in terms of like the perception of work at Africa Check in different countries? Or if yes, does it have anything to do with uh, any, you know, sociopolitical uh, structure that you observe? Or is this um, the basis, baseless censorship allegation against fact checkers that are a global phenomena that you just equal to see across the continent as well? Yeah, I'd say that um, unfortunately, none of the countries where we operate have escaped the phenomenon. Um, we, we, face the sim we face similar allegations and similar struggles. But I think they're really, um, as I was listening to the contributions, they're really two points that stand out for me. Um, and I think Gulen really you know, nailed the first one. And that is that I think that platforms um, can do a lot more to mediate and communicate the role that fact checkers are playing. Um, a lot of the angry emails and inbox messages that we get regarding our involvement in the Facebook third party fact checking program comes from a complete either misunderstanding or just no understanding of what is happening to the user. And I think a lot of that has to do with the actual interface and the notification that users get when their content has been fact checked. And I think that the platform could do a lot more to communicate what has happened, why it has happened, who has taken that step. So that fact checkers don't have to bear a lot of the brunt, um, which of what is usually just a misunderstanding or a shock or a surprise. And I think that would go a long way to, to reducing our inboxes and the, the vitriol that we experience. Um, and then secondly, an important, an important aspect for the work that we do at Africa Check in all of our countries is that we see the publication of a fact check um, really as the start of another process in our work, and that is our impact work. So once we've published a fact check, maybe that results in content being rated on a platform or not. That's where we hand over to our impact team, and they get in touch with the person who has been fact checked, explains, you know, why they've been fact checked. You know, that person has been dealing with our fact checker, so that they know about us, they know that the report's coming. But then the discussion, mediation, negotiations process starts, where we really try to explain what we found and why, encourage people to make a correction, or at least to add a note to their report. Um, because we, you know, we really want to make more accurate information available in the countries where we work and engaging with the people we fact check post fact check is a very important part of that for us. Thank you, Kate. Um, we have a question from the audience from Katie from Poltafact. Uh, the question is very relevant to this, you know, um, challenge, unfortunately. Uh, many organizations have seen uh, some coordinated attacks against their employers, employees particularly when either one of their fact checks are not welcomed by a publisher or, you know, some angry, you know, groups out there. Um, is there anyone among this um, cohort would like to address that? Uh, I know that Kate, again, very recently had to deal with this very really, um, delicately. So maybe Gulen, you might be helpful um, in, you know, explaining about that and we can ask Eugene and Kate as well. Yes, yeah, sure. Actually, I can uh, I cannot say any um, way it's working because at the end they attacked and we get hurt actually because they the the media organizations just just um, put our face on their news and attack directly to do our founders for example so it's really hard to uh, just stop this online harassment and it's uh, continue. But in generally, we are trying to do just uh, taking a deep breath and just not thinking about and not focusing on the these harassments and these lynching campaigns. And we are trying to 
find a way to explain ourselves. And it's actually healing because it's really important to showing our success actually is the key for us because we have to showing our impact. And it's actually it's the only cure for uh, such a harassment. And of course we are trying to uh, protect um, our writers and uh, trying to um, solve these issues more, how can I say, um, not directly respond to these peoples and mostly if these harassments is go beyond the criticism and if it's turning to kind of, I don't know, it's um, maybe dan dangerous. So we of course use our uh, legal rights to just stop this uh, harassment. But at the end we, saw these articles, we saw these news, we saw these tweets, because also we have to tackle with and we have to find a solution to answer this. So um, actually we try, our, uh, try to pro protect ourselves in a different ways, but I think it's, it's really hard to uh, completely protect uh, our employees and ourselves from such a, a online harassment, I guess. Um, and this is a very uh, common um, concern that we have been seeing around the world as well. I mean, the International Faction Network offers um, at least some uh, resources to help fact checkers who are need, in need of legal assistance. And uh, lately, we have also have been uh, in a position to realize that we also need to provide more guidance, uh, not necessarily through us, but from organizations that have expertise in this field um, globally on communications, crisis management. And I think a big part of dealing with this online harassment is also uh, being able to communicate internally to basically uh, keep the sanity of your uh, employers and uh, then, you know, tackle this using legal terms. Uh, legal means. Um, so, I mean, we have been talking about, you know, census allegations and the work that we do at the platforms. And that reminds me that um, this new next question should be really about, um, first of all, recognizing the impact of fact checking, because the things that we are talking right now were not necessarily part of our daily workflows um, like a decade ago. Um, so it, I guess it's fair to say that fact checking had, fact -checking had made a way since its inception, um, at least in this capacity, its inception in the 2000s. And as the wise man in this panel, I, I, I would like to ask Ojin to hear his thoughts on how you think fact checking had grown over the last couple of years, um, maybe since you know the uh, launch of factcheck.org, and where, what do you see at the horizon of fact checking in the years to come? Well, um, I started fact checking at factcheck.org in 2010, and it's um, it seems like a light year ago because what has happened over that period of time is is just uh, phenomenal. The global growth of it. Um, the expansion of it in, in the United States to include um, uh, just traditional media, uh, not just uh, these little niches that exist like PolitiFact and, uh, and, and Fact Check. Um, you know, 2010, when I first started, there were days where there were, everything was, was quiet. You were trying to find something to Fact Check. There wasn't, you know, we, we were, there was not, none of the social media um, explosion of, of uh, misinformation. Uh, we were getting emails from readers uh, and we would respond to those. We had a, created an ask fact check uh, feature. Um, it was uh, very quaint almost. And, and now it, it's just a torrent of uh, misinformation uh, from top to bottom. Um, in where, uh, where it goes from here, um, I don't know, but um, you know, I, I, th I think we need as, as a community to work together. Um, and, and it's great that the International Fact Checking Network exists uh, to bring together fact checkers with what is going on and how everyone is dealing with different challenges and the new innovations that, that exist out there with uh, AI and, um, and, and how uh, the outreach uh, that uh, Kate was talking about, um, 
to, to try to correct this misinformation um, and make it stick rather than just throw it out there and hope somebody reads it, which is basically the, the old model um, that, uh, that factcheck.org uh, pretty much uh, invented. Um, so there's, there's a need for that. There's a need for, uh, for funding that allows uh, some sustainability. Um, this is uh, a, a problem that's long existed uh, for, for all of us. Uh, we've been luckier than most at, uh, at factcheck.org, being at the University of Pennsylvania and having uh, some of that, uh, those resources, legal resources and um, housing resources, and you know, to be able to absorb some of the, the costs of, uh, of, of fact-checking, but there needs to be uh, more funding for it. It's nice that the social media platforms are stepping up. They need to do more, uh, frankly, what, uh, than, than what they are uh, to continue to grow uh, fact-checking. Fact-checking is uh, just a small part of what social media needs to do in order to uh, deal with the problems that they have on their platforms, which are just overwhelming. Um, and we need to separate this idea that, that uh, fact-checking is going to be the solution. Fact-checking is part of the solution. What we're doing is, is providing accurate information, try to reach as many people as we can. That needs to continue and it needs to grow. Um, that's separate from social media trying to get its hands around how to uh, reduce and eliminate the uh, not just misinformation, but the uh, hateful, dangerous rhetoric that exists on these on these platforms. So, uh, you know, I, I think it takes uh, it takes a village, as uh, someone once said, um, between the international fact checking community, social media um, and us, all of us. Right. I mean, first of all, I have to agree that, like, you know, 10 years really feels like, you know, light year. Um, even the last just 12 months, you know, feels like ages. Um, and the growth of fact checking, the impact of fact checking, the, uh, the recognition of fact checking has definitely exponentially increased over the course of those years, not necessarily just, you know, um, vertically. So uh, I'm going to ask this question to Kate uh, similarly given the importance and the relevance of uh, Africa Check um, as the first uh, continent, Africa's first fact-checking organization. Um, how has that been um, a process for you to be the first fact-checking organization in Africa? Um, you are also um, one of the organizations that uh, aim to bring different disciplines together. You just talked about briefly about the AI project that you work with. Um, where do you see the future of fact checking in terms of like automation um, and the impact, the measurement of the impact, and what what is making you excited about the future of fact checking? I think there's a lot to be excited about. Um, when it comes to automation, I think that it's it's very important that um, different fact checking organizations are clear on on where they view automation in their work. From Africa Czech's perspective and from the work that we've been doing with Czech Yada and Full Fact, we really do see it um, very corralled and fenced off and very designated in the work that we do. And there are two uh, main areas at the moment where we see it playing a significant role and continuing to play a significant role. The first is with claim identification. Um, like I said earlier, we have built a tool that is able to look at hundreds of thousands of sentences on a daily basis and only show fact checkers ones that contain a factual claim. This then um, is accompanied with filtering technology, which allows us to look at claims that are associated with the specific speaker. So in South Africa, on any given day, I might want to have a look at things, at factual claims which have been made by our president, Cyril Ramaphosa. Uh, we can filter by topic uh, and we can also look at types of claim. So we can look at claims about quantity, we can look at claims about causation, and it really gives us a way to sift out all of the stuff that we don't want to look at and only focus on the stuff that we know is relevant and important at the moment, given the other inputs that we're having um, from other places. The second tool, which um, could have a very significant impact is called claim matching. And that is because we all know as fact checkers that 
um, you know, we publish fact checks on a daily basis, um, but what we want to do is we want to increase the juice from each squeeze. When we publish a fact check, we want to know on a daily basis if that claim is being made again somewhere else. And it may not be the exact verbatim um, claim that's made, but maybe slightly different, slightly different words. We want to know if that claim is made again so that we can then decide what steps we take. Either we publish a new fact check, maybe a spot check, we contact the person for a correction. And in that way, we're able to, when it comes to very important and potentially dangerous claims, especially with regards to health, we're able to pull the weed on the claim. Because we've seen in the work that we do, if you take the time to pull the weeds and every time that claim pops up, you fact check it, you take an action, the, the recurrence of that claim does diminish over time. Thank you, Kate. I mean, for those who are willing to know more about the initiative that Kate was talking about, um, please check out um, either Africa Checks or Full Factor Chicago's um, social media accounts that they um, today published their um, journey with the Google Foundation um, on using AI for their you know, uh, workflows. Uh, so I strongly encourage that. Uh, so I'm going to uh, forward a uh, question similar to uh, Gulin. But meanwhile, please uh, make sure uh, everyone in the audience to drop your questions either on the chat, in the chat or in the uh, Q&A section. Um, and we have two questions there. Please feel free to um, you know, surface your questions. Um, Gulin, so you have been doing fact checking in almost three years, if I'm not mistaken, right, at, at Tate. Um, what makes you like, you know, excited about for the future of fact checking? And maybe I can also ask a, a follow up question to you as well. And what makes you worry for the future of fact checking, either from a sustainable perspective or scalability perspective? What are the things that you would like to share in terms of um, addressing the growth and the future of fact checking? Um, actually, um, the, the exciting part of um the fact checking and the future of the fact checking is i think we understand that we need to create impact and we should measure this so i think fact checking organizations should uh just trying to find a way to measure their impact because we are doing this for um i think creating social impact in turkey so we um I guess find some ways to understand what is our impact and how we can enlarge this impact. So it, it's the, the first thing for uh, Turkey and Tate. And the second thing is we try to understand the, the consumption habit of the information in our own country. And we try to uh, understand what the the differentiation and what is the different uh, part of this whole um, information ecosystem and in Turkey and what is the unique part of this um, job. So the, with, with this idea, we are trying to focus on the uh, country-based uh, information platforms, like because we uh, we have uh, very different platforms and the, the circulation of the information should um, actually fact checked or actually trying to um, maybe just put on our agenda. So it's the, um, the, the, the second exciting part of we should focus on country-based uh, tech companies or tech platforms or social media platforms because it's also uh, kind of a way to a kind of escape from the big tech companies and uh, the dominance of these companies, I guess. And uh, this, the, the, another thing is we need to promote information activists like Wikipedia. Uh, during the pandemic, we collaborate with Wikimedia Turkey and uh, spread the truth about uh, especially uh, COVID-19. So it's really important to uh, increase such a um platforms in our own countries or in in um in the world so the media literacy and the creating such a campaigns in schools in universities is really important for uh us it, and we had um good steps in in the in, in the in increasing digital media literacy so em empowering information activists and creating more platforms in our 
uh, SAIX is another step for TAID to enlarge this uh, impact and creating more impact in this information flow. So what, what can be worse and getting worse in uh, Turkey? I think getting information from the uh, source is a kind of um, hard and it's getting hard and hard. So it's a little bit um, confusing and it's a little bit sometimes um, create some obstacles to solve and fact check some uh, claims. But, um, but to tackle with this, we generally uh, try to find a way to expand boundaries of our organizations, not just saying it's true and it's uh, false. And we need to just explain the context of the information and we try to expand our boundaries while fact-checking a content, fact-checking a claim. Because the problem is, uh, during the pandemic, with the conspiracy theories, we saw that um, Sometimes we cannot say it's true or not because it's too complicated to say this, but we need to just uh, find a way to fight against this mindset. So it's really important to focusing in-depth articles or in-depth contents to uh, find a way to reach people and find a way to just put their, in their mind this uh, digital critical uh, thinking idea. So uh it's it's a both it's a kind of obstacles and kind of um hard to sustain but uh we need to um reach people in offline places because um this kind of remorse is spread in offline places and we cannot catch uh it's uh, it easily so um, it's a little bit hard to catching these um, claims on social media because people just get afraid of sharing their ideas in a country like Turkey. So they just go to the closed networks and they just uh, talk in their own communities and in their own offline places. So um, it's both challenging, but it's also maybe... Um, yeah, the most effective way to address it maybe. Hey, thank you so much, Gulin. So um, we are now just in, we only have like three minutes left. And I would first of all like to thank all of our panelists. I still have one more question to them. Uh, and also special thanks to everyone who made to this session. And um, this panel will be uploaded to our YouTube channel as well. So you can also feel free to, you know, share it with your colleagues and, you know, with team uh, who may not have been able to make to the session. Um, and um happy international fact checking day um thanks a lot for being part of it um i just like to finish this uh session with asking this question to all of our panels so uh unfortunately um we don't have a name it was an, by an anonymous attendee but i think the question is a great you know way to end the session so uh we are almost halfway through 2021 but even though those you know two months We'll never know what we'll see in those two months. Um, but for the rest of 21 and beyond, uh, what are the expectations, especially around like, you know, the main challenges that you will be seeing as fact checkers? Just, you know, a minute long answers will be really appreciated from our panelists. And then um, we appreciate you taking part of this. Thank you. And then I can just ask, at least in the order of my screen uh, from Eugene, uh, and then, you know, move forward. Okay. Um, well, in the United States, I think the biggest challenge for uh, fact checkers is um, what happens in this post post truth era. You know, when um, President Trump was elected, uh, there was all this talk about you know we we're entering this post truth era, um, but now he's he's no longer president, um, and it'd be interesting to see where it goes from here. I think we're at a critical point in the United States in terms of um, trying to um, uh, present accurate information to a very skeptical uh, public. You know, where it's very, um, uh, very, there's a strong partisan divide in the United States um, and a large percentage of the population see the news media, including fact checkers as, you know, enemy of the people. Um, I think we have an opportunity to do something uh, with COVID-19. 
Um, and what we've been focusing on is uh, trying, uh, we've been focusing on COVID-19, focusing on getting accurate information, to people help the underserved uh, readers, uh, try to uh, deliver a really, uh, you know, this is, this is, this is just factual information. Um, and it's an opportunity to try to, you know, do a little course correction here in the, in the United States. So that's what I feel is, uh, is important here in the, in the States. Thanks, Eugene. Um, Gudin, you you barely you 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 just recently touched on this, but maybe in a just you know um, sentence or two. Yeah, maybe I can say that the distrust to the organizations and the distrust to the the, the people uh, uh, actually it's kind of a challenge and it's a, a negative um, possibilities to not carrying any information coming from the uh, reputable organizations like fact checkers. So maybe it can be uh, it can be a challenge in a polarized countries. And I think there isn't any non-polarized countries anymore in the world. But uh, yeah, maybe I can say this. Thanks, Gudin. And I agree that the number of like non-polarized countries are just you know vaporizing day by day. So, um, Kate and. Um, Thank you so much for joining everyone and and we will be just wrapping up with Kate. Thanks, Bebas. I think just three points from me looking forward for the rest of the year. The one is that I think fact-checking organizations have to, you know, move from survival mode uh, to planning mode. Last year, we spent most of the year putting out fires, running from fact check to fact check. Um, it came out of nowhere. We were in the midst of it and you just couldn't stop. But now you really need to put in the time to think, to plan, to strategize, to fundraise so that our work is sustainable during this time and after. And then secondly, you know, we're all dealing with pandemic fatigue. And I think we need to find ways to keep our audiences engaged in what will continue to be a pressing health issue. And thirdly, just look, looking at the issue of expert fatigue, the people that we rely on on a daily basis are probably sick of hearing of us um, and we need to find ways to engage with them also in a sustainable way um, and and work with them as partners moving forward yeah that's very important i mean at the end of the day everyone working in an affecting organization are actually human beings and you know we all need that sort of like you know break sometimes and hopefully this weekend um just we're gonna have after this international fact checking they will be at least a good way for us to zoom out a little bit and then you know come back to our work on monday but you know that that's not possible it's actually it's seven to four job and i'm happy to see that we are almost on time i mean for those who have been to global fact conferences before know our dedication to punctuality and i'm really grateful to see that we made this wonderful conversation um, on time and um, in just half an hour um, our next ifcn talks for the international fact checking they will be moderated by uh harrison mantas uh from ifcn so i strongly encourage you to also take part in this and then Happy International Fact-Checking Day, and thanks a lot for coming.